Welcome to another Real Left Guitars M -m 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 Monday night and there's a beautiful sun going down at the end of a gorgeous summer's day um, and we have Luke's uh, Telecaster Fender Telecaster Player Plus Player Plus uh, dropped off yesterday on his way down for a few days in glorious Foy which is a lovely spot in Cornwall and I'm envious because I'd like to take my canoe down there and my kayak down there and jump in anyway um, so here it is butterscotchy color I know it's probably got a proper fender name but it's that sort of a translucent -y, uh, see the grain through it so it's a lovely butterscotch thing it's got noiseless pickups and interestingly I hadn't seen this before but a push pull which I think turns off the noiseless bits as far as I can see that's what it does I could be wrong I haven't looked at the spec um, three-way switch if these pickups and whatever the electrics is are in here is very um, bright uh, really needs work on the you need to you need to work the tone knob to control it, it seems really bright um, not a bad thing I, I prefer to have a start out with a brighter sound and then tame it rather than not have enough um, and we've got the fender locking tuner so this is made in Mexico um, I sat down with this last night and made as you can see by the way it's got the comfort belly carve here but that's all it's got in terms of carves it doesn't have a forearm slope or anything um, so I sat down with it last night and I had a kind of look at it up close and so here's what I can report on it so the first thing I noticed was the usual things I noticed, which is the balance of the strings there. The high E string is practically falling off the fingerboard. And while you're up close looking at it, then you start to see some of the classic, oh God, amber colored spray up the sides of the frets in various, um, it's not easy to sort of see it, but you can see it there. Yeah, quite a lot of this stuff blooped up the side of the frets. So need some realignment on the neck. And then I kind of looked at it with by the torchlight at home, actually, in bright torchlight, I looked at some of the fret conditions. Now, this isn't common across all of the frets. All of the frets have got the amber finish blooped all over them. But look at this. Look at the hammering that the fret ends on this side. Now, this is about 12th fret and around there. So 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, something like that. They've taken a real clanging with a leveling beam. So probably a radius block. So it shows that um, these those frets in this area were not, um, you know, were standing up a bit. So this is the this is the old Fender Meteora problem, and actually, it, it's a by that I mean it's a problem that I've seen in, in particular with um, a, a Fender Meteora. That young Tom had collected up all his money to buy for himself, and in fact he went through about three because the fret condition was all very much like this. In fact, quite a bit worse, but. It had all the goo all over the, the frets, which made it look ugly. And in, in, on top of that, it had various levels of fret leveling that had been done. Uh, and just for a new guitar, it felt like, well, it shouldn't look like that. And of course, sometimes you will take that much material off when you're leveling frets on a new guitar or a build. But at least you could do, really, when you're making a 800 odd pound guitar, is to crown them again so that they go back to their original shape as much as possible. Now, it isn't always possible if you've got one or two really high frets like here. You may still find that the the end here never truly um, recrowns out the way it, it turns into a bit of a blob at the end, but it's better than this great flat thing. Um, anyway, so that's the first couple of things I noticed. Um, looking up close at the nut, the nut appears to be the, I think, is it Corian they make it out of? So it's a bone, a synthetic bone. Um, it's it's obviously pretty well cut, um, and they've they've included it in the finish, so you can probably see if I change the lighting. You can, I don't know what I'm changing there, but oh yeah, no yeah, stay focused. Um, if you if I change, no, I'm so sorry. This is not obeying me. Yeah, it's um you can see it's got amber stuff on it I'm making a real mess of that camera work. anyway it, it it isn't the perfect seated no it's not bad I mean, it's pretty accurate but it does have some amber finish over the end um 
Now, if, if necessary, we'll remove that and re, you know, refit a new or fit a new tusk nut. But I'm going to go on the basis if it's not broke, let's not, um, let's not fix it. But we shall see. It looks pretty well cut at the first fret height, so you know, um, let's not change it if it doesn't have to. What else did I notice? Um, well, another little cute detail here, which conveniently sort of works out as it happens, but. Um, let's say you, this wasn't perfectly intonated right now. Okay, can you imagine what would happen if you tried to move this back? Can you see, and I can see, we've got grub screws about to climb up the side of quite a tall uh, screw. And it's been hidden by the dark a little bit. That's, that is quite a proud uh, fixing screw. And you can probably see it better from this angle. So that sticks up quite a way. And it's in the way, and the one on the other side is also in, in the way of the saddles moving anywhere. Thankfully, they appear to be on the, you know, on the point, on the mark. But that is, there is no more uh, real adjustment room left in there. That is, that is just about hitting that saddle. And it might even be, you know, kind of tipping it up one side a fraction. But hey, it's probably not broke, so I don't think, again, we'll have to fix it. But it's just an... It's just an observation. I mean, why would you make a bridge like that, a fender, and then fit screws that sit quite a bit proud of the surface? Um, it just seems uh, seems bizarre to me. Anyway, we'll hopefully uh, it's not going to be an issue. If it becomes an issue, um, then I don't think it's worth spending a load of money to replace a bridge. We'll see what we can do about either sinking these further down, um, or I don't know. Let's. Um, well, let's see what, I mean, we could get a flat, flat headed screw um, that would probably work better. But you still don't want your saddles to be running over the slot head part of the, of any screw, whether it's, um, whether it's a proud sort of dome screw, or whether it's flat, you know, you don't want the, the grub screws risking falling into there, which they may just, just be clear off. I don't really know, but it just makes me concerned for it. I think it's a bit of a silly thing. Right, what else have we got on this? So we have got loads of notes that are... That's, that's on its back, but playing it this way. Chokes out. So it's uh, not a good player at the moment. Um, now I know that Luke's kind of moved it around lots to try and get it to play okay and he hasn't got it where he wants it so I'm feeling that we're a bit low anyway on this side right now so we're going to go through and set the correct action um, another little detail correct me if I'm wrong I could be wrong I might I may be wrong but I saw this yesterday and I thought to myself there's something going on here let me just hello oh come on wake up you can do it clear I'm just going to do a tiny little observation and do Get out of the way. Thirty-five seventy-one down there. Thirty-five. There's half a mil. Look how accurate my eyeballs are. It actually diverges by half a mil. In other words, it makes it feels to me like it's going that way, and it actually is. But half a mil. I'm being, I'm being uh, petty. But I can still spot it. Isn't it amazing how the eyeballs are? All right, another problem with this, we have the Ratley original style. Now, all I can do with that is uh, attempt to fix it with my gripping thingy. But what I don't have is a thing that goes over it. So it's a bit of a handful fix, not ideal. Um, but we need the Stumac, what do they call it? Jack the Gripper, I think they called it. It was some sort of funny, Ha ha, not, probably not that funny title. So we have this thing here that stops the um, thing turning backwards. Then of course we have to attempt to tighten it up using rather less than ideal tools, I'm afraid. Somebody's gonna say they've got a device that works for this. I did have, this thing came with, and I've got it hung up somewhere. It came with a thing that I thought was a was it going to be the thing that worked for it and it, it appears that it goes over the um, gripper thing 
and then comes down and you'd think it would come down to the standard nut um, size to grab hold of the nut and, and do this uh, tightening bit. But incredibly, it doesn't seem to do that. So right now I'm just trying to hold this thing in place long enough to go get some tightening into it. And we counter do it. Now it's tightened up a bit. Let's just see if I can find that device wherever it's hanging around. Where did it go? Just the, and here it is. This, I'm sure, I'm absolutely certain this thing came with this. And the idea was somehow that goes around there like that. But for what point? I mean, it fits over there, but am I, am I, am I missing something? I That doesn't do anything. It doesn't grip on anything. I mean, but ideally what I would want, if this was a sane world, I'd want a thing that comes down here, fits in there and allows me to go like so. But it doesn't. It doesn't grip this. Why isn't, why isn't, am I missing a whole piece? If anybody seen this before and knows the answer to this secret, pretty certain they came together and that's what I would have expected a little sort of socket that goes on the end there but it's nothing but the same diameter practically as that so what good is that I must be missing something um I, so I thought to myself well is it vaguely possible with some sort of box spanner well first of all the box spanner is the wrong size anyway so I'd have to get a different kind of one um and then I would have to well, what would I do? I wouldn't be able to turn it. So that's not going to work. So I'm sort of stuck with manual gripping with an um, a less than ideal gripping thing, which I just think is rubbish. And it has to be something that fits over, a spannery thing that fits over. And I've got nothing that will fit over this while it's holding it. Um, and that seemed to be the, the nearest thing only that was... You know, would do the the business, but it certainly hasn't doesn't bear any relation. I mean, could it be that it fits in a? Could that fit in a particular jack? Uh, jack? That's not the word I'm looking for. Socket. Where's the socket? Let me see. I mean, this is a bit of a, a bit of a long shot. If I go any square sockets, let's see if this fits one of these, and it could be built to go over a socket. So. There's the thing that will go in a socket. That's a potential. Nobody ever explained this to me. Do you know that? So that won't fit. That's the wrong size. So the, the problem there is it has to be a large socket to fit the... Uh, uh, could we got an adapter that would fit that? No, in the, in the word. There's that, but that goes around the corner. That's not an adapter. Sorry about this. So let me take a let me take an eleven mil for example, which is not the size, and I don't know what the size actually is. So the idea is maybe we can find a, a correct size piece and attach it to that thing. That's what somebody will be saying to me, "You fool! That's what it's meant for." And I can't actually diagnose the size of this. <laughs> Thirteen, twelve. This one claims to be eleven. So 14 is going to be too big by miles. Well, you can't even fit that in there, so that can't work. So it ain't going to be 14. That's an inch and a half. It is American made, so it could be a metric. Oh, lordy. Half an inch would probably work, but it's the wrong size there. Sorry about this. You'd think I'd figured this out before. I think I'm ready and waiting. Well, I haven't. I may spare you the misery in a second. Ooh, for, for, for 13. There's a 13. Ooh, that might work. Right in there like that. Do you think possibly? Yeah. Let's let's see. It's a it's not the perfectest. So let's go through here. No, that won't go through there, will it? Holy holy moly. So that isn't gonna work. So what it's a nice idea if that only so much has worked, but that cannot go through that device there. It's a circle and it's, you know, I could drill that through. Do you know what? It would be, right, I'm gonna put this on hold. I'm gonna find the right one and then I might even drill it. Wow, result, I managed to 
drill out this bit. And I'm hoping we may all together, all together now, we may suddenly have got the thing we need to hand. Let's just tidy this for a minute. And let's just give it a go. That would be a marvellous outcome in the world of potential outcomes. So the rule would be still a bit warm, so that's okay. So we do this backwards. Oh, no, we don't do it like that, do we? Foolish boy. We put this on first, push that all the way through, and we go backwards. Oh, yeah, beauty. Oh, my lordy, lordy. I have become happy. Right, that is going on the wall somewhere safe with this equipment. Oh, marvellous. I'm going to wash my hands now because I've got them oily from doing one of the metal work. Oh, you fabulous thing. So you, old chap, with your jack plug sized thingy if you excuse me thingy we're going right there as a combination i'm just gonna uh, oops sorry while you're looking at that beautiful guitar i'm just gonna wash my hands clean oh yeah oh yeah got a sort of burly smell in here from melting some metal whilst making that it was not easy to uh, cut out of or widen that hole with not massively sharp drill bits, but good enough in the end. Right, oh yeah, oh yeah, okay. So we have now tightened that up good and proper. Lovely. So the next thing I'm concerned about is getting the neck um, aligned properly before I do anything else. So I'm going to get the thing the thingy here pressy thing name known as you know what I mean it's called <laughs> capo just gonna slack this off for a minute and then we're gonna do the next move and it needs to push a little bit uh, that's a little bit yeah, a little bit towards me or actually down right so we get the correct screwdriver thing uh, so I'm probably going to do this setup over two days because it's been a long day already. Not in the workshop, I have to confess, but doing other things. Um, so it would be tiresome. Uh, I want full power. So we're going to slack this off a little bit. And, and a little bit here. Right, I know, I know now. So while it's still attached there, what I want to do is I want to push it down a little bit and get it to align in a slightly different position. Tighten up these two, and then the opposite, and so on. So let's just have a look. Yeah, that's a better, that's half and half. So what I'm going to do is, before I do any more, I'm going to just tighten that manually now to its final resting place. So that we're on the target. Occasionally, when there's no rig wriggle, wiggle room at all, uh, you sometimes may just have to do a tiny bit of sanding in the neck pocket at either diagonal. Um, very careful sanding in order to allow this neck to move but the spacing on here is pretty tight for that neck anyway so there isn't a lot or an awful lot of room either side of the frets anyway okay so while I've got the strings um, thingied and I'm, I'm done um, I'm going to slack them off and I'm going to make uh, mark up the frets now somebody asked today actually and it was Rob on YouTube asked today, um, was it today, somebody asked today about the messy material on the frets on these, these Fender premium guitars. 
how would you go about getting it off? And my answer to that would be uh, only with the normal fret polishing method. In other words, don't, whatever you do, don't try and cut it out with it. Well, you, you can do, you can scrape it off here, but who knows what it will do when it gets down to the corner. My feeling is if you do the leveling, um, mask off the neck, and then do the crowning part, which takes off quite a bit of it anyway, followed up by the sanding part, you'll end up with most of it off. Not absolutely every bit of it, but I think you have to live with uh, a little bit, and I don't think there's a, a way around that, unfortunately. It's the downside of the way Fender are doing it these days. To do it another way, um, i.e. to not spray over the top of the frets, is a, is a more time-consuming way. And I found out the hard way, I mean, I've done it a few times that way, I found out that it's, it's pretty tricky to keep a, a, a neck that you've done that way looking good right the way through to, you know, the sort of um, the finish. Uh, it's easier, of course, if it's matte like this one is, but if you're trying to get a gloss neck all the way through to the, the end game, um, it, when you, when you uh, gloss up the fretboard first, or the, yeah, the fingerboard first, and then you um, kind of do your fretting that way around, uh, the fretting process sort of mucks up the finish one way or another. So I've got one here that I did uh, a few weeks back or a couple of weeks back. And that was done uh, glossed first and then fretted afterwards but since then since fretting it you know it's picked up kind of marks everywhere and I've oversprayed the body sorry the bulk of the neck with a different finish which hasn't come up in as much of gloss which is okay because I probably want to satin on the back anyway but uh, the point is it's a hard thing to do which I sort of understand why they end up doing the, the stuff this way which is to fret the neck first and then spray over the top because you get you get a fairly decent finish and you radius block level it before it leaves the factory to give the user, the buyer, some opportunity to set an action of their choice, a preferred action. Um, but the downside is, well, that's a plus. It definitely is a plus. But the downside um, is that while you give the customer some action setting options, um, you do it without recrowning or polishing out the frets. So you, you get left with this um, amber coloured stuff and you get the flattened frets. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to put this into tune or tune this up uh, and then we're going to check the relief and the action. Now, when I got this guitar, there was a lot of slack still left in the strings. And um, as a result, I was getting it to go out of tune a lot, very quickly, very easily. So one of the things um, that I wanted to point out to Luke whilst doing this is that if you want the guitar to start out in tune and stay in tune, you've got to get the, the stretch right. The, um, you've got to get the strings stretched out. So there's barely any, um, hardly any thingy at all. What's the word? <laughs> Relief. Um, it's nearly flat, which is okay. I mean, people like nearly flat relief, but I'm going to, uh, we don't know what the fixing is on this. It's Mexican, isn't it? So it's gonna be a different one. Um, yeah, so, so people like it flat, but I'm going to, this one says GS Mini. That's, is that the same as the Mexican one? I have a feeling it might be. Yes, it is. Look at that. So I'm going to uh, do a tiny bit of a turn counterclockwise. Um, so I'll give it a little bit more relief than it's got. That's actually stacked up there for the use with the tailors. That's the Taylor neck bolt hex key. Okay, so I've given it a bit more relief. That'll do for now. 
and I'm going to need that again because I'm going straight out of tune. So the idea is with this setup is, is I've taken care of a couple of things that are important. One is the alignment as much as I can. It's, it's not perfect. I would, you know, in a real world, would I try and change it at this end a little bit? It hardly makes any difference by the time. Now with the available space we've I've got, I've, I've adjusted it as much as it will go and it is equidistant, equidistant. So that's, um, that's as good as you'll get. So I've done that, done the tightening of the thing with a modified tool, yes. Now we're going to um, set the playing setup or the action that we want. So I start with the neck relief. Right, now I set the neck relief, tuned it up. Um, I'm going to look at the first fret action, uh, sorry, the last fret action now. And on guitars um, I set up, I like to aim for a 1.5 millimeters. Um, 1.5 mils at the low E up to 1.2 millimeters at the high E. Now this is currently a fraction low. So um, I, I think Luke, you have to, you're going to have to keep in mind, that's now a tiny bit high. We're going to end up with something that maybe a tiny bit more higher than you've currently had it set, but that's based on knowing what it will do and what it won't do. Um, this is where I wish I had some other glasses to get the light a bit better. Still a tiny bit, I've gone too far, so down a bit. Right, so I want 1.5 on the first few strings. That's just about it, actually. It's not far off. A fraction low, if anything. So as we come across here, I think we need just a tiny, a tiny wee jab to raise it. I'll start with that and then we can come backwards if we can. I found that Telecasters, strangely, even at 9.5 radius, they can be, they can struggle to work with a very low action or my target low action. For some reason, Telecasters can put up a little bit of a fight. I never quite understood why. There doesn't seem to be anything else about them. I, and I think it's because I keep saying it and therefore they, they put up a bit of a fight. But with a, an electric guitar with a nine, 0.5 inch radius this should set at the 1.2 mil last fret action it should kind of happily accommodate that now we've changed it only a little bit but so a tiny lift on the e really uh, So what we had was zizzy notes around here, halfway up the neck. Um, yuck. And then we had choke outs up here. So I'm not gonna bend any more of them because I don't wanna take the black marker pen off just yet. So I've got my action set there. Now I'm gonna check it down at the first fret. And technically, it would be a good idea to make any tiny adjustments now on this nut if we were keeping this nut and if there were any required. So there's a fraction above what I would normally go for. I'm going to assume it's a, a good nut. But let's, let's, not, uh, let's not change it if it, if it ain't broke. Um, some, some guitars, obviously, you know, you'll see straight away that the nut is gripping. Um, or you can hear it's pinging or it's it's clearly not going in it's staying in tune in which case you can be fairly sure that it needs some work so I'm going to widen these sluts uh, sluts yeah I'll start again I'm going to widen these here sluts um, it, it's a bone material and it it has to be wide enough um, now if it isn't you struggle with friction which is what we don't want which is why I tend to prefer uh, the artificial tusk stuff. Now what I'm just going to do on this, I'm going to, for the time being, I'm going to scrape some um, that stuff, that pencil-y stuff, carbon, into the 
uh, slots. These strings will be thrown away, so they're what I call sacrificial strings. I'm just using the pencil to scrape some dust in there. You can get it out of it. I've got a pot of carbon, not carbon, graphite uh, in the other room, but I, I never use it. It's too much. I just a piece of pencil. A pencil, sharp pencil will do. Obviously, I'll clean that up, but to begin with, what I'm looking to do is to, if I can, which is not working out the way I wanted it, I want to give myself uh, a little bit of mm, graphite on the bottom of the bottom of the nut slot. And now on this one, I'm going to now just very carefully run the fret file backwards through it, pointing backwards. So I'm widening it a little bit, but I'm taking care at this first point in time just to widen and not to reduce the front edge any until I get to the point where I think I've widened it and I then have a tiny amount that's practically on the mark. So I'll just leave it, I'm not going to go any further. So here we have the, um, the B. There's a little bit extra space, so we'll do that. So it's only a tiny amount, but I'm, I'm just helping to widen that, the uh, slot because if it if it remains straight walled then it has a potential of uh, dragging the string which I don't think it's doing on this but I just want to make sure it's part of the deal um, so I, I lean back with the, the fret um, file and then eventually as I think I'm about at the right wideness I just use it to cut down a tiny bit and it really does only take the slightest tiny bit so I have to be very careful when I'm removing any off the front edge and taking it, the action down at all just do a little bit recheck it and redo it nearly there it's very very delicate if you if you get impatient with it and you start to uh, file too hard before you know it you can find yourself dropping below the target level I don't know what you can see can you say okay yes you can um, in that case you have to start again really uh, you could do a, a, a fix uh, super glue type repair but it's I prefer not to so as you can see there's not a lot of leeway if you kind of go a couple of times and you go over yeah, knockered. So I'm very close to being there, and uh, there comes a point where you sort of say to yourself, I think I'll just stop there. I think I'll just stop there. I could go a bit further, but you're just asking for trouble. It's close enough, and this one's a fair bit higher. So, otherwise, it's all in all, it's not a bad nut at all. Um, being well done. So I give, you know, give the fender people props on that. It's only a little bit higher than I would have it personally, but um, I would say that it's not at a height that would cause any significant um, notes to go sharp down at this end of the neck. So that's a good thing. They've kind of cleared that hurdle. Still a little bit high. So this bone material, or whether it's Corian or whatever, fake bone, it's not, it's not easy to cut. It, it doesn't really behave the way you can tell. I'm going nowhere fast with it um, until at some point I'll cut it and it will decide to go in a big bush and that'll be the end of it. You say, well, how long are you going to spend doing this? And they go, well, I don't really know. Put a bit more pressure into it, they probably end up regretting it. Still a bit high on that one. I suspect that this little spare one that I've always used, which has got a much better cutting edge to it, will probably do something straight away, which I suspect it has. It's almost there. So these are good for, the, they make the right shape. The Chinese jeweler file is very good for um, actually cutting. I'm happy with that, leave that there. Quick, well, the, 
going's good or something. Okay, so now we're going to do that side, and we're going to do it's going to be a tw tw 26, and this is pretty much the right height. I'm just going to check the width of the slot now, really, more than anything else. So, shooting backwards to begin with. Looking good. Again, I think that is where I want it height-wise. I'm, again, I'm just going to make sure it's uh, running free. Okay. And this one looks fairly good too. Nearly there. Tiny bit. That's interesting that the, I can feel that the gauge of this as set on this uh, nut slot is bigger, considerably bigger than the 10 gauge I've got here. Uh, yeah, that's pretty good. I'm gonna stop with that. So a little bit of a sand to clean off uh, afterwards, but I won't worry about that for now. Yeah, so the, the, the preset slots on here are quite a bit bigger than um, necessary. You know, they go, they accommodate. Some people think, oh, if I change strings, will I, you know, will they get stuck in the nut? Well, not in this case, because it's got a lot of room. This is very sharp here. I'm gonna round these off so they're not as painful. Okay, so the next thing to do here is gonna be the fret leveling. Um, so this is a challenging bit for this guitar. I can I can sense already because it's it's not happy. The fretwork isn't happy. I, I can see that it's been hit hard in the factory by the leveling process, and I can see that we're probably going to have to work hard on it here. Which, if it's really bad, then you just you don't want to be doing that for a new guitar. This is practically brand new. Now don't go down that road of well, if it's so brand new, send it back. Because people, um, you know, they, they they want a certain guitar and they, they're probably, I'm not speaking for the customer here, but they're probably aware that, you know, every one of them is coming out of the factory like this. So it's, it's going to be six of one and a half dozen of the other. And yes, you could say, well, from now on, I'm never going to buy another Fender. I'm just only ever going to buy, I don't know, vintage V6 or V52 or whatever the nice telly version of the vintage is. But, you know, you could take that line. But you know, people love their things they love, and you know that's how it goes. Okay, so straight away in my leveling process, I'm already seeing, I'm getting a hint of what's going on here. You can tell. Now remember, we had buzzings down here, right? So I don't know how well this shows up in the light. I always try to get it so you can see it. Well, you can see the dust. Okay, so a bit of cutting, a bit of cutting bit of dust, so a fair bit, none, none, none. So that's a complete low section here. These drop down. Then we've got a high one here, a high one, a relative high one, as well, sorry, an actual high one as well as high relative to these. So notes played here, just played here, will struggle to hit that. They're hitting that because A, it was high to begin with, but B, it's made higher by the fact that these are down in a dip. And this is the topography of the neck that you don't see with any other method of leveling, I don't think. So up here, you've got a whole pile up here, which feel to be in a similar plane all the way along here. And then it goes down and you've got a sunken bit or none of these are cut at all from about there onwards. So you've got, I would say, uh, normal, low, high, normal, 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 low. And you could plot that out as a sort of little picture if you were bored enough. But so that's what this method of leveling shows me. And um, I'm just going to do a tiny bit more. So that's, this, that's what I call a diagnostic um, level. We hardly put any effort into it, but we've kind of revealed pretty quickly where there are substantial low spots and any significant high spots. And, and if you just were to look at the amount of um, dust that's kicking up, you can see high, high, uniformly high, low, and very, very low. Well, this one's the lowest. This one's now starting to come, just get touched by the, the cutting surface of the 
sandpaper, 400 grit sandpaper. But so that, that gives me a, an interesting sort of view. And that tells Luke why it's such a bummer to play down here, because this fret here, anything played in this half here is catching physically on this high fret, but anything played here is worse as well because you're playing it down in a ditch, which has to come up and makes this fret even higher. So it's not good. Now, what we'll, we don't know yet, we won't know yet is, um, or we won't address yet the problem with the bends, the chokes on bends, and we address them when we come to what I call the G track. This is the E track. So the first thing we want to do is hear these notes sound better. which they do. I'm hitting it with a metal brass pick, by the way. That's better. So that bit of leveling there has taken care, but we can see we've, we've hit that one. That one's not been touched at all. That one's been hit a fair bit and everything else has been hit with a couple of bits higher than others. So we know we're taking some high bits as well. For example, that one there and possibly that one there. And then there's a fleet of five, the last five frets are below the radar, so we're, we're not getting uh, to them at all, which isn't a problem, they're playing okay, um, but we just, we know that they are low. So now we're going to do the B track, and again, the B track still isn't the point at which it chokes out on the high bends that we've got a problem with. That will get addressed um, when we get to the G track. So right now I'm gonna use the same calibration for the B track. Now, what we find usually now when I'm running the uh, tool over the neck in the B track, um, we'll now sort of get a sense of if the high spots and low spots continue across the radius, because sometimes they change over a little bit. You might find something that's really high at the edges suddenly flattens or lowers as it gets towards the middle and vice versa. So again, looking at this, it shows up pretty quickly. There's a high one, you can see the dust. That's a high one too, really. The second one's a little bit high. Definitely these three are low, which is where the buzzing was coming from. Everything else after that, that chunk's good. We've got a few high ones here, relatively speaking, compared to over here. And then we've got a low section again, which will probably play all right now. So it's confirmed that the what we saw in the first track of the E track was you know, confirmed what we sort of knew to, or told us what we needed to know about what was wrong. Slightly squelchy up at the 12th fret, that's all, but everything else is recovered all right. Again, so it might not need all that much at this sort of I mean, I am obviously leveling already. I'm not just you know, dusting the fretboard. I'm doing some leveling even to even to diagnose what's going on. Okay, that's, uh, now you might say, how do you know how much or how little to do? How do you know when to stop or when you're in a danger zone of wrecking your frets, for example? And um, well, uh, that that's a bit that mostly comes with experience and there, it's like a lot of things. You know, I could show you how to shoot a bow and arrow, but it would take you a while before you, you know, you're performing at a consistent level in an archery club and hitting, you know, good scores every every week you go or whatever. So it's, you know, doing it is one thing and kind of learning how to read it and um, make good decisions as a result of this uh, method is, is obviously a different thing. Right, so now I've calibrated for the G track and the G track is the one that we're going to get the chokes improved a bit but not completely not too bad it's improved a little bit already from leveling out these uh, high bits but hopefully now when we level the G now it's calibrated and um, we should take out any high frets up here that were causing uh, the chokes when we bend. And the, the, the reason why strings bend, sorry, the reason why they choke at a low action, um, the reason why they choke when you bend them and you have a low action set is because you, uh, in bending them, you are pushing them up a hill, basically, the, the radius hill, which starts, um, 
starts at the bottom down here and then comes up the hill to a higher point down here, up here. Um, so as you go up the hill, your string is starting down here and ending down here, but you're bending it up the hill to the middle of the G track, which is where you normally bend to because otherwise you're going over the top of the hill. Um, and that fact that it's going up a hill takes away any clearance that it would otherwise have. Not bad, we're very nearly there. Could just do a tiny bit more in the G track and then we'll move on. So this bit of the leveling process has, um, has told us what we need to know about the ups and downs in the neck. It's given an idea of what we're gonna encounter on the rest of the neck. Um, it explains why the notes weren't playing uh, very well in the first place, um, which will be Luke's experience of it and my initial playthrough experience of it, um, confirms to me why that was. Um, and then we take care of it and now we move on to the low strings. And the wound strings have a slightly different problem. They have the same problems, of course, the high frets get in the way um, and they need to be tamed. Low frets uh, create the next fret in line as being effectively high. So a low fret is pretty much the same as a high fret, thus it creates the same problems. Um, only a low fret is relative to a normal fret that usually follows. So it makes a normal fret effectively high. But the only way to stop the choking problem is to bring the two closer to each other. So you have to take the normal fret and the surrounding fret down very slightly to level them out or balance them out, even them out with the low frets. So low frets are the ones that always, in, some, in many ways, they, they they define, they define more directly uh, what you can and can't do with the, the neck in terms of setting the action. Um, a high fret, in a sense, is quite easy to tame. You're, you're just basically aiming to wear one fret down a little bit until it's even with the remainder, the rest of the fretboard. But a low fret, these are difficult ones. Um, low, low again, uh, low fret, demands that you, you can't just um, fill in the low fret and bring it up to the others. You have to take all the others down to the low fret, which is, you can see is quite costly in terms of fret metal, but there's no way around it. to the, the A track and I forgot to tell I'm gonna to have to tell my landlord there's a there's a over on the wall there's a Claire found it the other day I've been living with this beeping noise you may have heard on the videos for six months and it turns out I couldn't figure out what it was but what have I just done with there it is. Um, yeah, it turns out, as Claire discovered it, she tracked it down in a way I couldn't, tracked it down to, to a, a power box on the wall, which has something inside it that needs to be replaced or reset. So uh, it's, I don't really know what it is. It's, I think it's I think the uh, site owners will know better than I will what, what they put in line there. Some sort of surge protector, who knows, but it's got something that needs changing. So I think I will uh, alert them to it when I pay this month's rent and say, do me a favour, stop that beeping noise, which I've got used to, I think. Okay, so with the, the low strings, they because of the way they're made, they tend to move, and they, they're, first, they're often first in contact with the plectrum of the hand. They tend to move more, and because they move more, they require a bit more space to spin around in and um, 
with a low action. With a low action, you tend to take away that space. Um, and the lower you go, the less space there is for the strings to move. So um, what I've discovered over time is that the, uh, the hills and the valleys that I was talking about in the, when I first leveled the uh, E-track, we, we saw the kind of topography, the basic topography of the neck. Those hills and valleys um, seem to get in the way particularly of the lower fatter strings, the wound fatter strings. So the thing, the noise that I've come to call fret slap, which is the sound of uh, a kind of buzz that follows the notes all the way up a, fret, uh, up a, up a string, um, tends to come from this problem of the hills and valleys, or particularly the hills, constricting the amount of space that the, the wound strings have to spin. And so I found that this method, is, well, first of all, I found this method cured it. Um, it was really good at getting rid of what I call fret slap as a distinct from fret buzz, which is a single case of buzz, like from a high fret like that one. Um, but fret slap seemed to follow notes all the way up a, a half or a third or a quarter of the, of the neck. And so what I tracked it down to was, well, the, the reason I kind of worked out that this method was good at addressing it was because it maps the idealized curve of this tool onto the up and down, bumpy, uneven, imperfect curve of the neck. And that results in clipping off the top of some of the uh, peaks or the hills and creating less, just that little bit more space. with that. Now let's take off these sacrificial strings and what's the time Mr Wolf? Half nine. I think I will I'll do the crowning right now and then we'll call it a day for this session. So let's take off these uh, strings. One little thing um, about just a, a thing for you Luke. Um, when I I don't I don't like locking tuners mainly um, and I recommend that if you do use them, um, when you put the string through, put it through longer than this, okay? The reason why is if you just pull it all the way through and then um, lock it off, it'll crimp it right there. And if I have to take it off to do something and then I want to reattach it, it's going to put the crimp point right back where it was. If you start off by putting an extra centimeter uh, onto here, you lock it off and then wind on about a centimeter, it'll give you at least one go to take the string out, slack it off and put it back through. And this time, when you put it back through, you push it beyond the crimped first point and you use a fresh piece of string on this side of it and you'll get a chance. Um, otherwise, um, when you try and slack strings off that have been crimped and, and cut dead precisely flush, you chances are you won't get a second go at fitting them. Like that one just broke because it's already, it's already um, uh, crushed. I have to now poke out the little broken bit, but that's what it does to it. So you aren't going to get a second bite of that. And sometimes it's, you really find you need to be able to slack it off. Maybe you might have to get a, a saddle. There you go, that one's broken too. So you see, it's, it's pretty much busting these strings, just locking them. Now people say, well, you have to learn how to attach them less tightly. But look at that, that's undoing it. That's just popped it. So, you know, it. They're already, if you consider that they're already half broken by virtue of the fact that you've uh, crimped them at the extent of their, you know, the, the shortest length possible, then you're basically not going to get much chance at refitting them, um, which is a shame because, you know, it could cost you a set of strings where it didn't have to. And of course, as somebody doing setups all the time, that really annoys me if I'm doing a setup and then I, let's say I, Put all the new strings on, get everything sorted out, and then find that I've got to slack them off. And because I used, a, you know, I didn't leave a, a centimeter of slack, uh, I don't get a chance to make that adjustment without losing at least one of the strings, and therefore it's a new set, and so on and so on. So we don't want that to happen. So that's my little hint of advice. And I'm just going to, when I have a chance, I'm just going to keep brushing off 
as much of the dust as I can. There's a whole thing, I had a rant on the video the other day about um, somebody was convinced that sanding uh, the fret dust when I sanded it was going to get in the pickups. It doesn't. Fret dust is not magnetic. These normal frets, these nickel steel frets, are not magnetic. I did a video testing that, proving that. Um, the only, uh, funnily enough, the only fret wire that had even the vaguest whiff of magnetism was Evo Gold. Um, and that, that sort of crept just a little tremor towards the magnet, the neodymium magnet, I don't know what I was calling it, molybdenum, that's a chemical compound, um, neodymium magnet. Uh, and it was barely moving it right up close. Whereas, you know, those neodymium magnets, they'll snatch anything that's ferrous and bang. So the fact that it, didn't, it doesn't do anything at all to regular nickel steel, as people call it, frets, just proves it, it, well, it isn't magnetic. So these, this dust that I make whilst uh, crowning the frets will never go anywhere near the pickups, because it doesn't, because I brush it off. And even if it did, it won't stick to it because it's not magnetic. So there you are. Just, uh, I got a little bit tired of sort of explaining to people that. Now, so what I'm doing now is I'm crowning the frets, but if you you get a close up look, if you can, you see something that just came off there. Close up, sharp thing. As I crowned, you get this. See that? That's the finish from the that was up the side of the frets. Now, this makes crowning harder because it clogs up the uh, crowning file, but it's all, it is a good way of eventually, and it's another piece came off there and another bit's gonna come off any second now. There we are. We eventually, with a bit of clogging, we get rid of the uh, stuff. There you go, another piece straight off there. Look at that. Eventually the finish comes off the side and it, it well, whilst doing it using this tool, it seems to get it off without running the risk of um, pulling it up uh, underneath the fret where it, because actually the finish doesn't go underneath the fret in this case, because of the way they've sprayed, it goes over and forms a sort of bit of a, that's like a carpet that goes over the top. Now, sometimes you can still see a little bit of uh, stuff there and you can kind of, you can be bothered, you can just scrape it off very carefully but you know it's a it's a fair bit of extra care and attention fender don't mind it keeps me going so you can always tell when you're using a this stumac crowning fi file and you've got the finish going over your frets because the first thing that happens is this sort of glides along the skiddy shiny top and it doesn't seem to be doing anything and then you get the breaking off bits like that um, and and then you're through to cutting the fret metal which is what you want to be doing to reshape it and it makes a bit of grime build up down the sides of the fret and there's still a bit caught in there which I, you know you can either gently scrape out like i say i don't massively recommend working with something like the a little uh little blade here but you know if you're going upwards um it's because it's very easy, it's actually very easy to scratch the frets anyway so if you Desperate you can do it if you're very careful. But it's kind of better that if you let the this tool pop off anything that has to come off. And if there's any left there, we'll smooth it out with the sanding process. It's coming off and peeling off in quite chunks. Oh, what can you see anyway? Let's zoom out a bit further. There we are. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a... The problem is you can get a bit distracted because what we're trying to do here is first and foremost recrown the fret so that we've reshaped the fret but kept the level we've just achieved and as it happens most of that um, finish is also coming off with it um, so that would be when somebody says to me how would I get rid of all this ugly uh, sprayed over um, finish covering the frets I would say use a file like this a, a concave fret crowning file and that will take care of a lot of it but while you're while you're doing a fret crowning process so you might as well level your frets crown them like this and then let it take care of quite a bit of the built up 
overspray as I call it. Um, and anything that doesn't come off, we can either look at it a bit later and give it a pull like that, or um, you know, let the sandpaper do it. But before we get the sandpaper in, into action, of course, we've got to mask off the neck. Fingerboard, I should say. Fingerboard, yeah, the woody bit, yeah, the maple bit, anyway. So this is one of the first low, uh, quite heavily leveled ones. So I'm having to work a bit harder on that. Again, you can see all the bits coming off, cracking off, um, which is good. I mean, you want that stuff off. You don't want it on your frets looking uh, shabby and untidy. A fender, a, a fender. Um, ben Crow had a Meteora, Fender Meteora, one of the new shaped things. Um, of which I had a few, and they all had the same problem. It's like a standard thing they seem to be doing now in the Mexico department, but uh, he, somebody gave me a link to it, and uh, the video was him saying, probably the worst frets I've ever found on a Fender. And uh, I thought to myself, yes, I agree with you on that, Ben, three times over, because I've sent two back and done a third one of these, or Meteoras anyway. And his, yeah, his worst ever frets were on a Meteora and it had all the problems that, um, that I had on it. Okay, so these are, I'm noticing on these that there's a little bit of uh, stuff left over at the ends here, which would be nice to, to get off before uh, we sand, but we can try, maybe I'll turn it over and have a go from the other side. Now with the, with the technique of spraying over the frets one of the things you i'm not hugely confident about is the finish on the rest of the neck because you know how does it relate how does it connect with the finish on the side of the guitar neck you know if this flakes off is it likely to flake something else off so i would rather that we didn't we weren't kind of breaking seals of uh, like a creme brulee crust of finish that's what we're being asked to do here by Fender, which is to kind of crack, crack this carpet finish and sort of clean it up. Now there's one of the very hard hit fret ends. And as I say, we try and, like I mentioned a bit earlier, we try and crown it, but actually it's been so hard hit in the, in the factory, there's not an awful lot left to reshape. And we do as much as we can, so that right to the very end it's as, reshaped as possible but thanks to the original you know laying of the fret which is probably you know just been sticking up and not very effective fretting for some reason or other you know and i'm not mock i'm not mocking fender um no matter how much experience you have uh, how much experience you have fitting frets you you realize that it's a mechanical it's it's in effect a crude mechanical process is fretting um, so you really can't, uh, unless you're done by some machine that does it in some artificial man-made substance, not wood, then you might be able to place each fret to the perfect hundredth of a micron or something each time. But when you're a human being or a factory machine with a human operator pressing frets into wood, it's, uh, it's crude and you never... You never get it perfect so i'm not knocking fender for that they're, they're obviously you know they're trying to find a, a commercial compromise or you know yeah a commercial compromise where they can still make a profit and not have to do all of this work now i know you as the person who's paid 800 quid for this or whatever uh that sounds a bit rich to you and i understand that totally um but i also you know we, we can also understand it from a, a strapped business point of view that, you know, they, if they had to pay somebody a couple of hours to do this work, and even if they were good at it and quick, and it was an hour and a half or an hour, that's still an hour of labour knocked out of the profit margins, which are probably, despite what we want to believe, it's probably quite small, or could well be quite small, you know, that just because somebody has a factory and makes fenders we kind of think that they're well they may be but we, we do tend to default to the idea that they're rolling in it and making a disgusting fortune while the poor customer is getting shoddy stuff 
actually I think most people who've ever tried to do a similar thing and you can see in that I class a lot of guitar uh, techs who've kind of enjoyed setting up and maybe making guitars in a small scale kind of get um, I call it suckered into partnering with a Chinese um, factory to make their own line you know with all good intentions of a a quality you know reasonably priced quality guitar with all of those uh, cynical customer ser customer service quality control flaws ironed out the way they should be and I think before you know it those people are finding that they are subject to the exact same uh, constraints as the big companies who are trying to make a profit making guitars as best they can um, you know, nobody wants to make a bad one I think what these people find is that before long they're running at a loss or something or they've got a tiny margin by the time everything's taken care of and they're not selling enough enough bulk to for it to pay itself off um, to allow them to spend more money on somebody spending a couple of hours prep leveling in the factory etc etc and before you know it their guitars are struggling with the same kind of cost cutting quality issues uh, that anyone else has done throughout history. I think that's a pretty disappointing moment when people get there because I think a lot of people believe that somehow their guitar brand will be different because I care about it and nobody else before me cared about it. And there's an arrogance in that, I'm afraid, good people. And I'm sorry if you're one of them who's tried that. But there is a blindness and a certain degree of arrogance that all the others who came before you and didn't do a good job were because they just weren't like you. They didn't have the standards you had. And actually, you know, chances are you get stuck into it. Look at all of this stuff. Let me see it. A ton of fender finish removed. Now, I'm just going to flip this round because I think what I want to do is just um, run it. Uh, you can probably see. I'm run it a little bit off the other side of this to see if I can uh, just crack, crack off a couple more bits that I uh, don't want to come off. Um, and if I can't, if I can, great. If I can't, then that'll be the end of trying. Yeah, a few little crackly bits come off when you run at it from this end. Um, yeah, so I think I think people probably find out a painfully hard way that I think the thing they learn is that probably it wasn't it wasn't all ever going to be as simple as they thought, and it wasn't because the people before them who tried it were stupid or didn't care about it, and you know in a way that only I uniquely do. And I think people find that it's a subject to a very tight. Uh, commercial cutthroat um, thing it's not a very good word but you know what I mean Cut, it's a cutthroat undertaking it's capitalism and it's, it's small profits um, you know multiplied by millions of units and I guess I, I, I would hate to be that's, all, that's why I've always some people occasionally have people have said why don't you you know expand or get into making you know your own range of guitars and of course I, I enjoy making things by hand but I never would go down the road of trying to reinvent a guitar that's effectively been successfully produced by loads of people for millions of years the, the world doesn't need another one unless it's a custom one for somebody who wants something that nobody else has got and then there's a really good and interesting reason for doing it but to add another brand to the world of Fenders and Gibsons and you know Stags and Courts and all the Yamahas and everything that's been made that's such good quality and the world doesn't need yet another brand trying to fight on the same battlefield as all the other ones um, so and, and you know to get there I realised that you stop being a, a, either a guitar tech solving problems the way you, you love to 
or you even stop being a guitar maker, making guitars because you love to, and suddenly you, you become a sort of nine till nine, 12 hour a day, uh, hard nosed businessman talking to factories in China and pulling your hair out because you haven't got enough capital to, or, or cash flow to take the next delivery of parts that you've already ordered and they're chasing you for and so on and so on. And, uh, and then when you get it in, you've got all the problems of quality control and what you do with it and how hard you fight for your rights to you know, have a new set made or will they try and fob you off with a, a, a slight reduction and then you have to try and sell those to people and say, well, it's not really my normal quality, but it's just, God, it's a, it's a thankless game, I think. So that's one of my life, uh, life learnings is you know, don't be led astray into something you didn't ever particularly wake up wanting to be in the morning, you know, which is I don't want to be a, an industrialist making, making things and finding, squeezing tiny profit margins out of mass produced things. So, so that means I'm not a guy who's going to go and set up my own brand of guitars in Indonesia. Because actually, if I did, you know, what are the only real motives? I mean, oh yeah, I could say I want to give a quality guitar at quality price to guitarists like myself. Well, so does everyone. Um, what else could I say? Oh, I, I think I've got a guitar that's so unusual design that it changes the way the world will play guitar. Well, maybe. That's cool. It's probably... Um, there's not that many things you could probably invent that would make a substantial difference to the world of guitars. I'm not saying none at all, but probably not that many. And then half the time, I think it probably comes down to a, a cringe, a cringe inducing factor. And that is that I think probably most of us go down that route when, we, when we're honest about it is because we like the idea of seeing our name on a product and you know, it somehow it'll be a testament to our greatness or our design skills or our, you know, guitar skills or whatever it is. But And then you realise that most of that's about ego or all of it's about ego. You know, I just wanted to, I want to see fact, guitars coming out of a factory with my name on them or I want to see someone on telly playing my guitar. Yeah, of course, it's, it's a, a buzz for a minute, but um, it's not going to, it wouldn't sustain me for much longer than a minute. Go, yeah, if somebody famous is on the top of the pops, look, how's ah, my guitar? Well done, Sam. You're not on top of the pops playing it, but you, you manufactured it and you gave up all those lovely summer days to traveling to factories in China and shouting at people and pulling your hair out. So somebody else famous could play them and live like rock and roll kings on top of the pops. You get what I'm saying. It's not. It's not for me. Um, so I would always say, if you like making guitars, keep on making guitars, and be open to recognizing the moment when you've actually stopped making guitars, and perhaps you're suddenly um, you've become a, a guitar you know, manufacturer. You know, using using Chinese labour. Was that what you wanted? Because I think it'd be quite easy to fall into that accidentally. You know, with with all the best intentions as well. You know, all the things you think you've kind of learned about why budget guitars should be better than they are, and why that you know you kind of you think oh, you know I'll make mine my brand like this. And they won't be they won't be done like that. And, And I think there is a there is a mixture of naivety and arrogance in that because as you say the likelihood is you you realise that you aren't really the first person ever to want to make a good quality, well set up guitar for people with not too much money. Um, you just you know they they wanted it too, but like you they will hit the brutal you know, the harsh reality of of what gets in the way of doing that. Um, because I think everyone, you know, people who run car fixing garages and you, know, you name it, everybody starts out wanting, most people start out wanting to give a great service with their, or great 
product with great service and things i don't genuinely don't believe that anyone almost nobody on the planet wakes up thinking i'm gonna create a trashy throwaway you might say lord sugar but um nobody wakes up saying i'm gonna, I'm gonna make a fortune out of trashy products and sell them to a gullible you know, audience who hasn't got any taste or doesn't know any better apart from a few notable ones that we've heard of throughout history like Gerald Ratner and Sir Lord Sir Lord Lord Sir Lord Alan Sugar and actually I don't believe for one minute he ever set out to make a junk product I know he's talked about I think he's, he's talked about Oh, I can't remember, there was an expression he used for you know, selling people absolute garbage. And I, I don't think he set out to make garbage. I think he I think he realised he made he ended up making garbage. And I think in in that respect, I think he probably kind of rather than it's far harder to admit you made garbage than to pretend you intended to swim bull. It's much cooler to make out that you set out all along to make a garbage product. Anyway, um I'm gonna park this here for the night um, and, uh, and I'm going to come back and sand this out tomorrow and complete the setup um, yeah going good oh and I'll, I'll probably off camera I'll just reshape this nut while I'm here got a bit of fresh uh, stuff on here a bit of sandpaper will do the job so if you're ever going to do that, you might want to make a bit make with the green tape just to kind of ensure that you don't hit anything on the way around. Better to have a bit of a bit of buffer than none at all. Like so. First of all, I'm going to sand backwards. I will go in a minute. I'm going to sand backwards a little bit because this is a little bit flat for my liking. And so there's no reason, first of all, why it shouldn't be a little bit backwards facing. I also noticed that the, there's a sort of bulge between each of the uh, slots, which we don't have to have either. So the slots only have to be deep enough to hold, reliably hold the string in place and we don't really want any more material above that in any plane um, than that. So I'm also now going to uh, try and carefully remove some of this sharp bit on the end here. Difficult to see what you're hitting. I'll do a bit of rounding off as well the other way. So I'm just gonna make sure this stays away from the fret. A minute. Let's just round it that off a little bit and then we can get the other file a minute and just round the front edge off a little bit so it doesn't catch the fingers. Good. That's pretty good. All right. So I'll get my this file here, my three-sided file with a soft edge. You can see. You can see. So go. Uh, yeah. Just gonna very carefully round off the front edge as it goes around this corner here. And so it takes the as much as possible takes the sharp uh, feel off the front of the nut, and then. Same on this side, a little bit of rounding. That's a bit better. Okay, alrighty, that's us for today. Tomorrow, sanding out, um, clean up, fresh strings, and fit and stretch out. Uh, frets all polished out sanded out and polished out as much if not all of the uh, crunchy stuff removed in the polishing process. So now we're ready to restring. So to do that I'm going to 
zoom out and I'm going to, as mentioned before, I'm going to restring with a centimeter of wind on for each um, string, no, each pet post. Yeah, each string on each post. Because we want that little bit of um, unwindability built in. We don't want to be breaking strings as soon as we um, need to slack them off for any reason. Um, that is actually... That is actually standing just about, almost standing on the, what do you call it, this fixing screw here. I mean, I'm just going to, while I'm here, I'm just going to, I'm assuming this thing here is done up as far as it needs to go. But I'm going to not make an assumption. I'm going to just take this saddle off for a second and we might do the same to the other outside one. So it won't be any big deal. So we take the saddle off. I'll get over here, out of the way, and I'll get my screwdriver, manual screwdriver. And we'll just check the seating of this here thing. And nope, you can't get it any flatter than that. So that is slap bang on the intonation point. That's a stupid bit of design, Fender. It's not a showstopper as far as playing this guitar is concerned, but it's almost... Uh, you know, the fact is we, we just were able to, um, we're just able to intonate it. Now, as I pull it down here now, uh, into the intonation position, I can feel it. No, actually, I don't feel it going up over the thing. So maybe, maybe we're okay. I shan't freak out any more than is necessary. But I think it's a, it's a bit scarily close. You, when you, you know, when it comes to intonation, and the fact that no two guitars intonate exactly the same because of the way that the neck fits into the body and so forth. The last thing you want is to put a screw, fixing screw, in the path of the saddle where it needs to go to intonate. And if you can't figure that out as a manufacturer, then you oughtn't be doing it. Sorry, I know I'll probably draw some flack because I haven't well, I haven't made a guitar as beautifully finished as in factory terms as a Fender player, as in a gloss finish. But I'll tell you what, I've played, I've made guitars that help play better straight out, as it comes straight out of my factory. So there. Anyway. So I had, um, I've got a couple interesting guitars in. I've got one from Steve, which is a Jason Isbell Telecaster, um, and that's got quite a few uh, NAF similar type of issues to the stand down. I'm, I'm afraid it's another one that we can fairly safely say. Uh, it's another Fender, contemporary Fender, and I guess it's a Mexican Fender uh, sloppy thing, really. It's not looking good. And right now, if you were to ask me Honestly, would I recommend you buy a Fender, premium priced Fender Mexico like this? I mean, this has got a spec that's very particular, but if you were just looking for the best quality for the least money, I would be suggesting you definitely keep your eye on the, the uh, classic vibes. I don't know what's happening, whether they still make them or whether they're going to carry on making them, but. Um, that's a rubbish cutter. Yeah, the uh, classic vibes are, for the money, just superb fit and finish by comparison. So I really would strongly recommend that. So what I'm doing is I'm, I've lined up all the um, posts in the right direction so the holes are facing me so I can just push the strings through. Pull them through, make sure they're seated, bedded properly, hold them on the first fret and I pull them about a centimeter back and lock them off. Now, I know that it means it's not as, quite as quick and easy as you might want to do, but I do do think that you'll be grateful when they you get a second bite of it one day and you'll think that saved you a set of strings, I hope. So again, centimeter back, lock off. And actually, in this case, you don't have to lock off so hard. Somebody once said to me, Oh, well, the reason your strings are breaking is because you over tighten them. And that's maybe so. But the thing I would like to challenge somebody is, 
Okay, I'm not the Fender engineer designed this guitar, and I'm just a player. How do you, the player, know how much or how little torque to tighten up your string with? If it's going straight through, I guarantee you're going to over tighten it because the last thing you want is the string to pop out. And you've got nothing that says sufficient tightness achieved, right? There's no measure. So you over tighten it by by nature, by you know, by definition. And for somebody to go, oh, well, you shouldn't tighten it that much. It's, it's just stupid. So I think having put an extra centimeter on and giving it something to wind on, I do declare I can tighten the locking mechanism less than I would ordinarily if it was going straight through. Because I know that the grip is going to be assisted by this extra um, bit of wind on. So here we go, first one. I'm just pushing the spare string downwards and there we go. Yeah, so I've got the um, Jason Isbell to do, um, and it really is a bit unplayable as it stands. Um, I'm gonna zoom out, I just remembered, I need to. Uh, I've got the Perspex Dan Armstrong copy, um, which I'm waiting to hear from the owner. Um, if he wants to go ahead, I've located, he wanted a rail hammer pickup because he liked the sound of mine. So I've located them, but they've gone up in price since I last bought one. Of course, I should have known. Anyway, it's um, instead of, I thought it was about 80, 85 quid. It's 99 plus postage. So once I check with him that he wants me to go ahead, I'll get that ordered. Um, and what else is coming? I think I've got a Taylor acoustic coming. I may well have a Gordon Smith coming down. Um, so quite a few little things on the way in. Um, So the more I do this method, the more I see that, or more I'm beginning to see that this leveling method with the frets, uh, frets with the strings on and the neck loaded, I used to say that it, you know, for argument's sake, it was a little bit more accurate than doing it the conventional way. And accuracy, in a sense, wasn't the primary reason that I used to do it, or I do it this way. There are a lot of other reasons why, um, not least being able to hear the improvements I make as I make them and therefore stopping as soon as I've improved the action um, or the playability. But I'm starting to think that the, uh, the, the accuracy of this method is actually greater than, uh, I've, I always used to say 5% more accurate. Um, I, I'm beginning to think it's, uh, it's more than that. Um, so who knows but it's great that every time I use this method and somebody sends me a guitar typically they'll say this is this and this isn't playing right I will get the guitar I did this with the uh, this Jason Isbell Telecaster just today so I make an assessment of it and then write back to the owner saying this is what I found and it usually confirms to the owner what they suspected um, which is great uh, and then I get onto the setup and like this one, as soon as I start setting up, I confirm the things that we both, both myself and the owner suspected, i.e. where the high frets were. Um, what's working, what isn't. And it's great to, to re reaffirm as we go along the things we suspected. to bend so what we'll do is we'll now stretch the strings out and I recommend that you do this every time you fit new strings so get them between thumb and forefinger and push them hard um, as I said on many of my videos so you're sick of hearing it I'm sure 
but the tuning stability of your guitar comes down to two things only. It comes down to the condition of your nut and you know, are the slots causing any friction? Are the strings getting caught in any way in the nut? Um, condition of the nut and the other half of the deal is the amount of unreleased slack in your strings. And those two things, you get both of those right, your guitar will always, almost always be in tune. It will go into tune quickly and satisfyingly when you pick it up off the peg if it needs any adjustment at all. And then it will stay in tune throughout the playing session you know, to uh, bring a smile to your face. Particularly if um, you've had enough fighting guitars that won't stay in tune. So all this detuning from stretching would have uh, come out if you've been um, playing the guitar. But it would come out at its own pace, over its own, in its own time. And we don't want that to happen. So we go and we do it physically ourselves. And once you've done this two or three times, you tend to reach a equilibrium. And um, once you reach that equilibrium, um, you can just get on and play without any concerns. You can play a you know, guitar break and you're still in tune at the end of it, which isn't something that can happen if there's any unreleased slack left in the string. And it's just a myth that it will release itself. It will not, okay? It will stabilize, you think, and then you will bend the string uh, and it will go out of tune and you wonder why. Or you will uh, get it in tune, you think, but because you've achieved it by creating an, an inequality of tension on either side of the nut, because the nut is gripping the strings, and then you kind of play, stretch a string a little bit, it will release the tension and equalize over the nut. And it'll be out of tune. Close. Right, what I'm going to just check now is the action, because while we're doing stuff with the strings off, the, uh, the saddles can often move, or well, the grub screws can move. So I'm just going to double check. Right, we're on one millimetre there, that's really low. We're under, a, mm, we're barely, barely on a millimetre there, millimetre, just over a millimetre. We're actually fractionally too low. But you know what? I don't care. If, we're, if we can do it, why don't we do it just for once? Great, that's a really low action. <laughs> nice. Uh, one more check, just double check the neck relief. That's a little bit, maybe a fraction higher. Um, now, if we take it down, this may be where the low action then kicks in on the other part, i.e. Uh, if we take it right a little bit flatter on the neck, we may find that the uh, low height here becomes a bit of a, a problem. Oh, I need the correct one, don't I? Thank you, the Mexican. Taylor, Mexican Taylor thing. Now, to, usually to get an adjustment, you need to move two of the strings a little bit out of the way because it does not want to do it otherwise. Here we get, yeah, there we are. So a tiny bit to straighten out. lovely that's lovely i like it right so now the last thing i'm going to do is i'm going to check the neck no not that word intonation string intonation this um before anyone gets too uptight about this intonation is has a huge variable involved in the whole equation so as we're 
checking our intonation we have to um we have to what do we have to do we have to kind of take um we have to measure or check the tuning of our strings come on you're on so for example we tune to the pinged harmonic on the 12th fret so we tune that to e and then we fret the note should be the same note if it's the correct length of string so that saddle is in the correct position and that one is a bit sharp and that reason is this is very accurate i'll have to come back to the thing about variables in a second but you see that b it's really slightly in front of the e so that's registering is slightly too sharp so i'm going to pull that back because if it's sharp you need to extend the playing string length so i shall pull that back now the thing i was going to say is um each string has to have its own playing length and we're adjusting that with the saddles that can move backwards and forwards um, and to to test this we do that business of um, pinging the harmonic followed by fretting the 12th fret and they, need, they ideally should come register as the same note however and this is what I don't want to see we have to go backwards now onto this onto this uh, probably onto this screw fixing screw there we go let's watch it get hooked up on there will it want go over there safely yeah it's standing on it now that's not good fender i think we can live with it with a bit of adjustment but that that is not what i want to see a fender right um yeah but, but the point i was going to make is that because the your fretting pressure it's different for everybody um that's a huge variable in this test equipment or this, this experiment, if you like. Obviously that's gone sharp because we've moved the saddle. So it goes, it um, registers sharp on the attack, but then it settles off a bit. No, it's still a bit sharp so i'm going to slack these off again and i'm going to move them back a little tiny bit more the problem i have here is that this puts us into the territory of running into the well we're already there hitting that um uh fixing screw mounting screw bridge mounting screw which is a pretty naff thing to do but i've criticized fender enough about that to i've made my point you may find that we if we carry on like this we may actually fall across or fall over the other side what it's now doing is it's now running out of adjustment room uh, that's, cl that's climbing right up on the screw that is <sighs> poor i'm going to now cobble or fake a, a sort of a balance so it's now standing on that side up on the thing so i'm going to just tune this back up now just terrible Oh, Fender. close this under here keep that from bending against the table which we don't want now i'm hearing a slight twing noise but it's not the nut it's the string tree which i don't like particularly So 
Turns out we've got it to intonate, that's just fine, but it's required taking it back, uh, taking it back until the point where the uh, grip screws fall over the mounting screw, which is a pretty poor design decision, I'm gonna have to say. Okay, that's okay, I'll, I'll give you a close-up. It's intonated now, but the close-up will show you that we finally, after all of that, are, as I feared, a standing upon, I don't know if you can see it, but we are actually, that outside one is standing right up on the uh, fixing screw. Uh, I've obviously balanced it off nearly, not quite. It's, you can see it's not perfectly level, but with a bit of fiddling, we can get it level to the right action and everything. So it will play okay, and it won't cause any negative thing. But fender, that's, and that's not good. And on top of that, look at this. We are right at the crush. Okay, there's no more room. I'd have to trim down that string, the spring, in order to uh, pull that back any further. And we'd be riding down the other side of the thingy, uh, that thing down the other side of the fixing screw there. So that's, you can't, the, the tuning thing can't lie. That's the correct intonation position. Now, there is a variable in there, and I did mention that, which is the um, amount or the degree of pressure I apply. Um, and you can see if you want to make that, if I want to make that point, I can pick the note and then squeeze really hard and it goes sharp. So there is a variable in there. But the idea being, if you fret it as lightly as you can, that's the best way to set or test the intonation. But when people talk to me about, oh, you should spend 5,000 pounds on a uh, tuning app or something, or you know, a rack mounted tuning thing, if I can change the where the tuning uh, needle is going just by breathing or the amount I squeeze the note, then there's no point buying a super accurate uh, because I'll never squeeze the same amount twice, if you get what I mean. Um, and so the, all of that accuracy is a complete, it's a red herring or a waste of time. Um, it's just for people who kind of insist on having that kind of being able to say it's that accurate. So I'm just going to double check all of these again now because we've moved a couple of bits around. We've got this, we're slightly under the height here. It's a bit, almost a bit too low, which makes me nervous because I, I like getting things very low, but um, it doesn't give any leeway for the neck straightening out in transit or in a different environment and so forth. So sometimes when I do it extremely low, I feel chuffed, but then um, it can be it can change and flatten out or slightly change shape before it even reaches the customer. And it's not necessarily the most um, fantastic. Oh, that is on a fixing screw. Oh, they're all on the fixing screw. So there's four and this one's now climbing up. That's why it's gone, gone uneven. That's why I'm readjusting this. Having pulled it back to the correct intonation point, I now have a bunch of screws, uh, sorry, a bunch of saddles, which really aren't in the right place because they're now climbing up the blasted fixing screws, mounting screws for the bridge. Durr, fender, durr, rubbish. Now this one will be too high, yes, that's too high. That's just terrible. And that one's on, well, no, it's not quite on both fixing screws, but it isn't far off. Wow. <laughs> what we got here, we've got one point Sure, that's pretty low. We've got just about the same, and we're just under here. So we'll go up. But that's um, yeah, that's just lousy design. So with this one, I'm gonna have to reach right the way down with this foot to bring this one up. That's about right now. Um, but garbage, and it's it's also pushing the saddles to one side. I think in another time, I think this. Yeah, God, this, this really does want to be replaced. The problem with this is to replace it, uh, you've got to, you've got to get another bridge with exactly the same, um, 
well, yes, the same through hole. You have to match the through holes in the guitar with the through holes. You can't just go and buy any old bridge. So you have to kind of make a careful measurement of this one and duplicate it. Um, this is uh, this is rubbish, Fender. Sorry. Obviously now I'm way out of tune. Um, of course, also we've un, uh, slacked off the string, so it needs a little bit of pulling and stretching to get the strings bedded in. Okay, that's fine. Um, yeah, just the wrongest, wrongest, worstest bridge. There's four fixing screws there, not just two. Um, and now I can see that the saddles are, uh, the grub screws are climbing up on, on the other ones as well. In fact, uh, they're positioned such that every single saddle, no, they're positioned such that this saddle here is affected by the first screw there. So that one's affected by that one. This one here, that's sad. This saddle is affected when this one uh, just about to hit the fixing screw, but it's not quite. This one's back far enough, just far enough to hit the screw, which is pushing this saddle off to one side. It doesn't really want to ride up the screw, so there's a little gap open here. This one is hitting on the screw here, which and this one's been pushed off sideways by this screw because it doesn't want to. It doesn't want to ride up that screw at all. So there's a gap here, I don't know if you can see it, not good. Um, now all together, that pushes the, oh, God. well, I'm gonna call this done, but I'm gonna have a word. Uh, well, Luke's coming for this tomorrow. It's not a brilliant, it's not a brilliant setup. I mean, I would, if, you know, he's, you know, the problem is he spent money on this and you only, come, you only encounter its stupid problems when you get down to this level, um, when you get to this point of setting the intonation. It's not something you could necessarily, I thought when we first, I first had it, uh, first was adjusting it, I thought we'd just made it. But in fact, it turns out that this thing is not happy. I mean, it just runs into these things. Now you can play this perfectly well. It's not gonna, no, it's finally settled down. But yeah, you can play it perfectly well. It's not going to um, be unplayable as a result, but it's, it would cheese me off from now until the cows came home. These fixing screws could have been put close to the back edge of the, um, of here which would be, which should have been well out of the way behind the string through, for example. Or, actually, you don't really want them standing on screws, even if they're flat and flush. would I I think I'll take a couple of pictures of this I'm trying to think how I how I would recommend this to be fixed I mean uh, you, you know we, we could no you, you just do not want this bridge to be designed such that the point at which these saddles sit are in line with the fixing screws even if the fixing screws were visible a centimeter in front of this it would be far better but they've gone for obscuring them and put them straight in the in the line I just can't, uh, I can't actually quite believe it, but it is the way it is. So beautiful, 
you know, fit and finish and all the rest of it, except for that grim uh, design decision fender. So what we would have to do, and maybe I'll just do it now so I can maybe stand a chance of giving Luke an option with this for the future. Um, if I were to draw this out and measure, I don't think, I don't want to take it all apart to measure it, see if I can get the basics. What we've got to ascertain is, all right, let's go front to back. So front to back, uh, 99. Front to back, 99. Front to back, 99, with sort of standard stuff, but let's record it anyway. That's 80 width. Let's get that mark it up elsewhere. 80 width. Then we've got the intonation point of the high E on this thing is now basically, I would say it's 32 mils along here. So draw 32 mils along, put it there, 32. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. That's just my points, but I need to record the first one is 32, there to there. Then all of the stupid fixing screws are, I would say that's 28 to the center of the screw which puts it right underneath or just about we put it right underneath these screws coming back here so the fixing point is 28 and there's did i say 28 28 and there's four of them and that one lies under there well it's not too important but it's right underneath that point there so one two three four sort of thing so at least Four of the saddles are compromised a bit. Um, so that's, that's 28 cents to draw that in. Sorry about this, it's not very interesting for you, but you can see I'm just making notes so I can help Luke have an alternative choice. Uh, that's the only thing, uh, what do we need? We need the through holes. The through holes exist. Uh, the through holes are, it's not exactly perfect I guess, but 20 and a half, mm. 20, 20, actually I'd say 20.5, through holes are 20.5, put them in as uh, green, oh blimey, 20.5, so that's back from the saddle point quite a bit, 20.5, 20.5, 20.5, 20.5, 20.5, 20.5, 20 20.5, and anything else we need to know, we know what the spacing of that is. So we have to have, if we know the 20.5 to the, to the 20.5 to the through hole, and then we know that out here, not very accurate now, but we've got 79, 80, 79, 79 plus 20 is 99, that's about right. So 79 to the other side of the through holes. 79, 20, let's call it, we think it's 20 really. 20 from five or 20. Right, that's good enough. We know that where that's got to fit. Uh, let's take a measurement, shall we? Let's go to the fixing screw. So measurement to the first fixing screw is 56 and a half. Second one is 69 and a half. What did I say? 56 and a half, 69 and a half. 69 and a half first. So we have one screw there, one screw there, and one at the front. And we go 69 and a half is that one. 69.5 all the way the end and this one was 
56 and a half. 56.5 to the end there. Right, I think that's all I need to record because we'd have to find something where we need the spacing as well, which is 54 or 52 and a half. I can't trust that because they're all pushed out of whack now. Oh, why? Uh, I would say this is a 54 spacing. E to E. E to E. 54. There we go. Right, that's our measurements done. Sorry for a boring little finish. I can always cut that off. But that's my little record captured. And um, yeah, I don't know if you can probably see from here now. See the other two fixing screws hiding away under there? One there and one there. You can just about make them out, I think. Yeah, so four of them getting in the way of lots of saddles, creating, as you can see, the gaps. Look at that. Now we've got precious space available here. So that's a problem we don't want. This we can't do with these things spreading out. So that's messing up the playing thing. Hmm. Okay. Thanks for watching. Not so good, Fender.